mysterious rays. A spark jumped along the glass tube. William Crooks nodded. Yes, once the voltage built up, electricity cut through the air in the tube just like a tiny bolt of lightning. What would happen when he drew most of the air out of the tube? Could electricity travel without air to conduct it? He didn't know, but he would find out. William Crooks was the son of a tailor, a wealthy tailor. He had inherited his father's huge fortune. With the money, he built a private laboratory in his home in London, England. The government of England often called upon William Crookes to solve problems in science. He made many practical inventions to help working people. For instance, he invented safety glasses to keep the blinding light of furnaces from hurting their eyes. Unlike some scientists who grew old and set in their ways, William Crookes kept an active mind. He quickly took up new subjects. In the 1880s, he became an expert in making glass tubes with nearly all the air pumped out. At the same time, he became fascinated with high-voltage electricity. An induction coil changes lower voltage to higher voltage. Crookes made one that generated thousands of volts. He put the two studies together. Would high-voltage electricity travel through a vacuum tube? He hooked a positive electric terminal to one end of the tube and a negative electric terminal, known as a cathode, to the other end. He turned on the induction coil. The coil let him control the voltage. 1,000 volts, 5,000 volts, 10,000 volts. Nothing seemed to be happening. He turned up the induction coil to its highest setting, 25,000 volts. He experimented for hours. The sunlight streaming through his windows dimmed. Night fell. He stayed up, working late into the night. His wife and ten children went to bed. William Crooks went on experimenting. Gas lanterns cast flickering shadows on the walls. His eyes adjusted to the dim light. Suddenly, he peered closer to the tube. What was this? Instead of a sudden discharge, the tube glowed with a steady greenish light. He turned off the lights in his laboratory, plunging it into darkness. By the beautiful, pleasing glow, he saw the tube. It looked quite unlike anything he'd ever seen before. The rays came from the end of the tube hooked to the negative or cathode terminal. William Crookes called them cathode rays. He wasn't satisfied with just giving them a name. He wondered, what are they? Are the rays like light or like solid particles? He fussed around trying to figure them out. Usually the rays traveled in a straight line, but magnets bent their path, as did metal plates charged with electricity. Cathode rays couldn't be light rays. Magnets and static electricity do not change the path of light. Instead, cathode rays had to be some kind of particle. Several years passed before scientists discovered the exact nature of cathode rays. They are streams of very high-speed electrons. This was the first proof that atoms, the building blocks of matter, are themselves made of smaller building blocks, electrons. In the United States, Thomas Edison learned how to make glass globes for his light bulbs from William Crookes' experiments. Other scientists filled Crookes' tube with neon gas. When they sent electricity through these neon lights, they glowed with carnival colors, bright and rather gaudy. They could bend neon tubes to spell words or trace out designs. They are still used for advertising signs. Crookes' tube became known as a cathode ray tube, abbreviated CRT. For many years, cathode ray tubes were used as television tubes and in computer terminals. William Crookes and his cathode rays may seem far removed from medicine, but that is not the case. He had paved the way for one of the most dramatic and unexpected discoveries in the history of medicine. On November 8, 
1895, Wilhelm Röntgen worked late into the afternoon. It was already dark. Röntgen experimented with a crook's tube. How far did cathode rays travel after they struck the walls of the glass tube? Some scientists believe the glass of the cathode tube stopped the rays in their tracks. Others believe they passed through the glass and traveled a short distance through the air. William Röntgen, who was hardly known outside the University of Würzburg in Bavaria, where he taught physics, he turned out the lights in the laboratory and turned on the crook's tube. When he did, a glow from across the room caught his eye. It came from some crystals left over from an entirely different experiment. He turned off the cathode ray tube. The glow disappeared. He turned on the tube. The crystals glowed again. Röntgen coated a piece of cardboard with the crystal. The cardboard glowed when rays from the crook's tube struck it. He experimented and found out that the rays passed easily through thick pieces of wood and glass. He took a piece of paper coated with the crystal into the next room. It glowed even with the door shut. They passed through aluminum foil as easily as paper, but lead foil stopped them dead. Could these be cathode rays? No. Paper alone or a few inches of air stopped cathode rays. Cathode rays could not possibly reach the cardboard behind the closed doors. Besides, magnets had no effect on the new rays, nor were their paths changed by static electricity. Apparently, the crook's tube was generating rays other than the greenish glow scientists had observed before. Runchen concluded I've discovered a second and new type of invisible ray. One day he placed a sample in front of the cardboard screen. As he did so, a shadowy outline of his thumb appeared on the screen. Wait, inside the outline was a darker shadow of his bones. Incredible. Emma, he called to his wife, come here. You, you must see this. She watched as he flexed his hand, seeing the joints move. We must take a picture of it, Runt Jen decided. He wrapped photographic film in black paper and left it on the table under the crook's tube. He pressed her left hand on the film. Patiently, she kept her hand under the tube. Runt Jen waited for fifteen minutes. At last, he said, that's long enough. He took the film to the dark room. Finally, he came out. Triumphantly, he held out the still wet glass plate. It worked, he said. It shows the bones of your hand in full detail. The image is negative. Your bones show as white and the skin is dark. What's the white circle? Emma asked. Your wedding ring, Runchin said. The gold entirely stops the invisible rays. The rays need a name, his wife suggested. Runchin agreed. Mathematicians use X to stand for the unknown. I'll call them X rays. You must tell others about this, Emma said. Not yet. Runchin said. The discovery seems so mysterious, it lies outside of what scientists know. Without more facts to back me up, I'll not be believed. Invisible rays that see through human flesh? Impossible, they'll say. He delayed the announcement as long as he dared. For seven weeks he frantically experimented. Finally, on December 22, 1895, he announced the discovery. He also asked to speak before the next meeting of the Physical Medicine Society of Würzburg, Germany. At a meeting on January 23, 1896, Röntgen stood before the professors, scientists, and doctors. He delivered a lecture titled, On the Discovery of a New Kind of Ray. They greeted the news with polite but stony silence. How could he get beyond their unbelief? He offered to take an x-ray on the spot. 
I have brought my equipment with me, he told them. I need a volunteer from the audience. A well-known and elderly doctor, Albrecht von Koffaker, stood up and said, I will try. It will take some time, Runchen warned him. Runchen set up the apparatus and turned it on. After fifteen minutes, he removed the photograph and had it developed. It had worked to perfection. The hand showed clearly. The bones and joints between them could be traced out. The meeting broke up in wild applause. Some scientists walked forward to shake Runchen's hand. Others jumped up and ran for the exits. They raced to their laboratories to try it for themselves. X-rays took the scientific world by storm. Within a year, more than a thousand research papers had been written on the subject. In 1912, the nature of X-rays was found. Cathode rays are made of streams of fast-moving electrons. When the electrons strike the target at the other end of the cathode ray tube, they stop suddenly. The sudden stop changes their energy into high-power light rays. X-rays, then, are like ultraviolet light, but much more powerful and more penetrating. Doctors put X-rays to practical use. Only four days after the news of Röntgen's discovery reached America, doctors used X-rays to locate a bullet in a patient's leg. X-rays gave doctors a new tool of astonishing power. Was a bullet near the heart? Take an X-ray. A child had swallowed a safety pin. Was it open or closed? X-rays answered the question. Had the factory worker broken his leg, or was it merely sprained? X-rays showed the finest hairline fractures. Dentists took X-rays to find decayed spots on teeth. Doctors wanted to see more. They wanted to look at stomach, intestines, and blood vessels. X-rays normally don't show skin, flesh, and blood. These soft body parts are made of lightweight atoms, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. On the other hand, bones and teeth show up because the body's skeleton and teeth are of heavier atoms, calcium and phosphorus. How could doctors make soft tissues visible in x-rays? An American, Walter Cannon, solved the problem. He mixed a milkshake of barium sulfate for his patients. Barium is an element of high atomic weight. Once it coats the stomach and intestines, they become visible in x-rays. Röntgen refused to patent his invention. In 1903, the Nobel Prize Committee awarded him the first Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery. It was the only money he ever received for his invention. Röntgen's x-rays created a huge sensation, not only in scientific circles, but among the general public, too. Amusement parks put x-ray machines in fun houses and coated screens with zinc sulfide. Visitors could stand before the screen and see their own skeletons. Shoe stores used the machines, too. Customers could check out whether new shoes cramped their toes. All in all, people took entirely too many x-rays. The first person to call attention to the dangers of x-rays was Thomas Edison. The new rays poisoned one of his assistants. The man's hair fell out and his scalp became covered with sores. Edison and other scientists warned against needless use of x-rays. Sadly, their calls for caution went unheeded for many years. Some people suffered terrible radiation burns from overexposure to x-rays. We know now that x-rays can damage living cells. Exposure must be for short periods of time. On the other hand, cancer cells are more easily killed by x-rays than healthy tissue. Cancer can sometimes be controlled by treating the cells with x-rays. The discovery of x-rays is one of the ten most important discoveries in medicine, primarily for the ability of x-rays to allow doctors to see the condition of organs within the human body.